starting in the bathtub. Starting off with news this week, a study published in the Journal of Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics has sought to solve the question of why the universe has such an unexpectedly even distribution of matter. This is known as the clumpiness problem, as this research has suggested that it may be evidence towards the idea that dark matter is composed of axions, currently hypothetical ultralight particles. Why they are so difficult to detect if they exist is that this means they would interact with other types of matter very minimally. Axions were thought up in the 1970s, and it has since been proposed that these particles could actually be the elusive dark matter. Dark matter, hypothetically, makes up nearly a third of the energy composition of the universe, whereas visible matter makes up just half a percent. It is only observable by its gravitational effects rather than its ability to give off, absorb or reflect light. The reason it is so important, and why it is believed it must make up around 85% of all the matter in the universe, is because it holds the key to understanding why galaxies are held together. The gravity produced by visible matter is insufficient, so there must be something else, hence dark matter. This study has taken a massive survey of galaxies in our universe and found that the proposed nature of axions would potentially go some way to answer the questions of why galaxies are distributed in the seemingly illogical way that they are. There is no current equation or theory that answers all the questions of the universe. Questions especially around gravity and quantum physics remain. The standard model, a pretty comprehensive equation for how the universe works, doesn't quite cover all of it. Something called string theory was a theory proposed that sought to answer these final questions of the universe, but it has been heavily questioned and is far from confirmed. The authors of this study actually say that their work could support the validity of string theory, a fascinating extra step into how the universe might work. As always, the link to the study is in the description under our sources list, so do give it a read if you want to know more. And now over to Ben, with a few bits of comprehensive... Next up, we have the naming and description of a new genus and species of dinosaur from North America. Welcome Yarni smithy, a small herbivorous dinosaur from the early late Cretaceous of Utah. The specimen this species is based on comprises a partial but relatively quite complete skeleton, including much of the skull, vertebrae, ribs, and limbs. Interestingly, Yarni has been found to most likely be a member of a lineage of Ornithischian dinosaurs called the Rhabdodontomorphs, which up until now were only definitely known from Europe, although it's possible that the North American Tenontosaurus and the Australian Mutaburrosaurus are also members. Apparently, isolated teeth from Rhabdodontomorphs had been found in the formation in Utah before, but now there's a whole skeleton from one of these animals. Yarni, whose name is derived from Yarnus, the Roman god of transitions, is also important in documenting a dramatic change in dinosaur faunas. Rhabdodontomorphs appear to have become extinct in North America sometime in the late Cretaceous, as they apparently became outcompeted and replaced by the hadrosaurs and their relatives, but the exact timing of when this happened is still unclear. The discovery of Yarni though, which was around at this time of transition, shows that the Rhabdodontomorphs did actually survive into the late Cretaceous of North America. So a very interesting discovery of an important new dinosaur. Finally for this week there's also been an incredible new paper reporting on some fossil evidence for some of the earliest eukaryotes. The eukaryotes alive today, the domain of life that includes all those organisms with a nucleus in the cell, such as animals, plants and fungi, can all trace their ancestry back to the single last eukaryotic common ancestor, known as Lika. Lika must have existed sometime between 1.2 and over 1.8 billion years ago, based on molecular clock data. However, this seems strange considering the low diversity of definite fossils of eukaryotes that have been found in the period of time between 1.6 billion and 800 million years ago, coupled with the absence of certain molecular fossils indicative of eukaryotic cell membranes. Lika must have arisen from within another group of eukaryotes that includes now extinct side branches, a grouping termed the stem eukaryotes, which would have made cell membrane molecules that are somewhat intermediate with respect to crown group eukaryote cell membrane molecules. Well, fossil traces of these intermediate molecules have now been found, in rocks in northern Australia dating to 1.6 billion years ago. The molecules that have been found have been termed protosterols, since the molecules in crown group eukaryotes are called sterols. 
The so-called protosterol biota seems to have been highly widespread and abundant and were a significant component of aquatic ecosystems from at least 1.6 billion to 800 million years ago, comprising both bacteria that can produce protosterols as well as stem group eukaryotes. Although it's unclear what these organisms would have looked like, the authors suspect that they could have been the first predators on the planet, being more complex than bacteria and presumably larger, and therefore perhaps preying on these smaller organisms. Then, around 800 million years ago, the crown eukaryotes started to become more successful, and at some point the protosterol biota went extinct for unknown reasons. So this is really quite a major discovery, showing that the crown eukaryotes, our own ancestors, had a surprisingly late origin, and that a mysterious biota of other organisms were instead dominant for a very long time. Back to Doug in the studio. What an absolutely extraordinary discovery this is, showing that life really does, uh, find a way. I did the thing. Well, that's it for this week's late seven days of science. I do hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you next time.